In 2007, a woman heads toward the subway but doesn't get on the train. Instead, she waits for it to pass and goes into the tunnel, following a message on her phone that says, Answers lie under crossing 1114. When she reaches that spot, a new train comes and she barely jumps to the next track. However, on that track, another train hits and crushes her. Bangkok, Thailand, the data center of the National Archives. Max Peterson, a young American computer engineer, installs a security system to prevent hacking. Max completes his tasks and heads back to the hotel where the receptionist, anticipating his needs, arranges for a plane ticket ahead of time. She also hands him a parcel. This moment is captured by a video surveillance camera. Max opens the package in his room and discovers a case with a strange-looking touchscreen phone inside. After fiddling with the device, he heads to the sink to freshen up while the news discusses the ongoing debate in the U.S. Congress about funding for the National Security Agency. At that moment, Max gets a message on his phone. Why rush home? Half price rates at hotel? This weekend only, Mr. Peterson. After confirming the information with the reception, Max decides to stay in Bangkok for one more day. In Moscow, a general receives a report that a new phone has been detected. Max is relaxing at the pool bar. Another news report says that the NSA's funding has been blocked by Congress and that a plane has crashed near Bangkok the same one Max was originally supposed to be on. While Max is trying to process that he miraculously escaped death, his strange phone receives another message offering to buy shares of a certain company. The message promises easy money. A little later, Max asks the reception girl to thank the manager for his creative advertising. The man thinks it was through that ad that he got a text that saved his life. The receptionist claims she didn't know about any ad but assures she'll convey the manager his thanks. Checking the message's sender, Max discovers that the company's stocks he was advised to purchase have surged threefold in value according to the latest news report. When Max is about to leave and gets a new ticket, he receives another message, and the guy changes his route. Instead of home, he flies to Prague. At the exit from the airport, he's met by Yuri Malinin, who insistently offers to drive Max to the city, promising that he'll charge much less than local cab drivers. On the way, Yuri tells him that he's from Moscow and also notices that Max has a GZT650 phone. A device like this is not on sale yet. Yuri gives Max his card, offering to contact him if he needs anything, because Yuri loves gadgets and can fix any of them. Working as a cab driver is just part-time. Following the instructions and the messages, Max checks into a luxury hotel, but doesn't give up trying to find out who sent him a strange phone and why. Another message sends Max to the hall with slot machines where the guy bribes the man who's on the rigged machine. After giving him 100 euros, Max immediately wins 100,000 euros. Hey! This arouses serious suspicions, but Max technically didn't do anything illegal. The guy exchanges his winnings for chips and heads to play blackjack because that's what the phone told him. And again, following the clue, bets all 100,000. He wins. The guards notice that Max was looking at the phone, but after winning a huge amount, Max leaves. On the street, he calls Yuri and says that he needs some device that will allow him to read text without looking at the phone screen because phones are forbidden in casinos. Max pretends it's all because of his mother who keeps texting him all day long. Yuri agrees to help for 500 euros. In the corridor of the hotel, Max runs into Camilla. She comes out of her boyfriend's room who tries to follow her and when Max gets in his way, the stranger punches him in the face. As Max lies unconscious, Kamala searches him, extracts the SIM card from his phone, and copies the information to her device. When Max regains consciousness, Camilla's companion is already gone, and Camilla helps Max up. They flirt a bit, but are interrupted by Yuri. Camilla promises to find Max later. Casino security, meanwhile, is trying to figure out where the guy's messages came from, but they're untraceable, even though it's technically impossible. In the parking lot outside the hotel, Yuri hands Max an earpiece that converts the text messages into a voice. Max asks if Yuri can figure out who's sending him these messages, but the man says he'll only pull it off in Moscow, where he has the equipment and the right connections. Following the instructions in the message, Max goes to another slot machine and wins the jackpot of 3 million euros. Every 
everyone around applauds, but the guards are already rushing to the guy and he has to run. Agent Grant of the FBI manages to detain Max. The head of the casino security, John Reed, tries to stop him, and it turns out that in the past he worked in the FBI, but Grant still takes Max with him. At the abandoned factory, after tying Max up and putting a bag over his head, Grant begins his interrogation. He believes that Max bought the phone online using a credit card in someone else's name and then flew to Prague and robbed the casino. Max denies everything, and then Grant provides evidence. There's footage of Max and Yuri, a well-known hacker from Moscow, passing gadgets to each other. Even when Grant threatens the guy with a gun, he keeps repeating that he doesn't know who's sending the messages. In the end, after shooting just past Max's head, Grant declares that he believes him. Reed arrives at the FBI's temporary base at the abandoned lot, and Grant tells him that they are investigating a series of strange financial tips. The recipients are all Americans. They get access to easy money, and then they start receiving strange instructions on their phones. One of the recipients, an employee of the Department of Defense, received the text messages and following the instructions, disabled the protection of the Pentagon servers. It was she who ended up dying under the wheels of a subway train. The other recipients are also dead, all killed under different circumstances. Only Max survived. It's also revealed that Grant's cooperating with the NSA. Grant and Reed come to an agreement. Max is offered to help the investigation to avoid going to jail for fraud. The phone is taken by Grant and Max is returned to the hotel. Grant contacts the head of the NSA and asks for three hours before activating the tracking protocol. Meanwhile, Reed visits Mueller, the owner of the casino whose security he's in charge of. Mueller is outraged that the casino is so vulnerable and he's worried about his banks and trading companies. He demands to know who arranged the jackpot and how. Reed promises to follow his orders. Mueller reveals that he once had a falcon named Apollo, which Mueller acquired to make plumage for arrows. Despite all the bird's splendor and beauty, Mueller shot Apollo in the heart to remind himself what seems like harmless traces we leave behind can sometimes lead to death. Max, bored in his hotel room, receives a call from Camilla on the hotel's internal phone. They meet at the bar. Max tells her that he likes computers because they're reliable and don't hide behind words if they say something. Camilla says she's originally from the U.S. but is now studying in Prague. Their conversation is interrupted again, but Camilla agrees to have dinner with Max later and even promises to cook dinner herself. Grant and Reed tell Max they need three messages to figure out the source and the guy must strictly follow all the instructions of the anonymous sender. Taking chips and turning on his phone, Max goes down to the casino hall. The first message arrives. Meanwhile, a whole team of specialists is trying to trace the signal in the USA. The second message arrives, and it turns out that it came from the US territory. The third message does not come, and Max loses a huge sum. When he gets up from the table, the message does arrive, saying, that was your only warning. No more interference. Turn off the phone again, I'll kill you. Seconds before the exact location of the source of the messages can be deduced, the NSA chief commands to turn off the phone. Over the phone, he tells Grant that the source is Echelon. Max is brought from the casino to his office. Reed is not happy because his boss demands results and he cannot tell him that it's classified. However, Grant doesn't care. When Reed suggests that Echelon is to blame for everything, Grant advises both the former agent and Max to keep their mouths shut. Reed tells Max that Echelon is the NSA's central computer that handles global interception. That is, the one sending the messages is connected to the NSA. Meanwhile, the head of the NSA suspects that Echelon has been hacked. He demands his staff find out exactly who bypassed the security system and how. A disguised Marine will take Max's place. Even if someone's following, the swap won't be noticeable from far away. The head of the NSA wants Max eliminated to avoid any public attention. Mueller's not going to give up and thinks that Max will help him find the person who managed to hack into Echelon and send out the messages. Since Max is the only one of the recipients who hasn't died so far, Reed has to make sure he stays alive. Max has dinner with Camilla at her house. They discuss dreams, Paris gradually grow closer and spend the night together. In the morning, Camilla is awakened by a call from Reed, the head of security asked to detain Max and be ready for anything. A message pops up on Grant's desk phone detailing an address and time. 
A Marine posing as Max receives it and is warned about FBI agents monitoring. The message instructs him to walk across the street when the traffic light changes to green, but tragically, the fake Max is hit by a car and killed. Max, using Camilla's laptop, makes inquiries on Echelon and learns that the NSA is intercepting all calls, texts, and emails. Recent funding denied by Congress would have allowed the NSA to install cameras in every home. The funding fell short by just one vote. If it had been approved, there would have been complete surveillance of everyone worldwide. During a conversation, Camilla lets slip something that makes Max realize she knows way more about him than he shared himself. At that moment, Camilla notices a sniper on the roof, hides Max in the bathroom, and takes the hidden gun, but is wounded in the shoulder. More men with guns break into the room. During a heated gunfight, Camilla kills all the enemies. Reed shows up and takes Max away. The head of the NSA learns it's not clear who broke into the security system and how. Shortly after, Grant calls him and says that Max wasn't killed, he got away. Right then, Grant gets a message from an unknown number. I see you. I want Max or you die, Agent Grant. Along the way, Reed explains that the NSA tried to kill Max and it's necessary to find out who's behind the messages, then make a deal with the NSA. Reed doesn't have an actual plan. Then Max remembers that Yuri can help track down the sender, which means they both need to get to Moscow where they can find him. Reed doesn't think it's a good idea, but Max firmly believes that Yuri possesses the required tools and is more reliable than both the NSA and FBI. Reed shares the same sentiment. The guys arrive in Moscow where their faces are caught on a surveillance camera and the NSA immediately finds out about it and informs Grant. Max and Reed arrive at Yuri's apartment. The hacker is distrustful of Reed and the feeling is mutual. The former agent tries to interrogate him, but Max calms both of them down. Yuri asks for three hours to work and then, when they expire, informs him that no one tried to hack Echelon. Echelon was sending out the messages on its own. Before the plane crashed, it retrieved the fuel data from the network at the Bangkok airport, so it knew there would be a disaster. Echelon then intercepted a message about a deal that caused the company's stock to rise. It was also able to calculate where the jackpot would be at a Prague casino and counted the cards while watching the tables. Echelon easily monitors the world through cameras. Max is perplexed. Why did Echelon choose him? At that moment, more armed men appear near the entranceway, and Max and Reed are forced to flee. They steal a car from the courier, a tense chase through the night streets of Moscow begins. It ends at a railroad crossing where Grant gets out of the car following them. It turns out that he did not intend to kill Max, but brought him a phone. Max reads the threatening message addressed to Grant. The NSA also thinks that Echelon is sending out the messages on its own, so without contacting Max, there's nothing the agency can do. Max interrogates Grant the same way he interrogates Max earlier and decides to believe the FBI cop after all. Recognizing Max's face from the security camera, Echelon sends another message telling him to return to Omaha, Nebraska, where he used to work as a computer security engineer. Max, Grant, and Reed fly home on a military plane. In Omaha, with the help of a SWAT team, all three get into a bunker-like structure. Max gets the message, authorize BIOS, the NSA gives the go-ahead, Max does what's required of him. But afterward, the agent who sat in his place finds no data on the computer. At this point, NSA HQ detects the outbreak of copying and downloading of data. Finally, they track down the owner of the bunker. It's another victim of Echelon's messages, the man whose credit card was used to send Max the phone. Suspecting something's wrong, Max returns to the bunker and sees that Echelon has literally escaped from the NSA and forwarded itself here to Nebraska. He needed Max as a guide and needed the Pentagon employee to break through the defenses and escape. It turns out that after Congress prevented Echelon from being upgraded to a perfect tracking system, the program decided to deal with the matter itself. Now Echelon has escaped and started an automatic upgrade. Soon it will copy itself to every computer connected to the network and will be unstoppable. Grant commands Max to shut down the computer. Max is on it when he gets a message from Echelon saying, don't try it. 
The machine pulls up financial statistics because the second recipient of the messages had access to the data of all credit institutions. Echelon takes the entire country's money hostage, but Max thinks he can outsmart the machine. Grant calls the head of the NSA, but the latter wants Echelon on the global network in the interest of U.S. national security. If the computer took the initiative, that's only commendable. Reed also fails to convince the head of the NSA that something terrible is going on and Echelon needs to be shut down. Despite the superior's aggressive response, Grant and Reed come to an agreement and then philosophically discuss how soon other agents will rush in to apprehend the traitors. The men decide to hold their ground. Meanwhile, Max fails to stop the Echelon's replication countdown until he gets the idea to utilize the computer's self-learning ability. Max asks the computer what Echelon's main purpose is, and the computer replies that its purpose is to protect U.S. national security and the freedom of its citizens. After some thought, Max asks the computer to look for articles about the recent NSA bill that was turned down. Many of the articles express concern about trying to get congressional approval for Echelon modernization. They call it a threat to freedom. Outside, meanwhile, a gunfight between FBI agents with Grant and Reed ensues. Reed asks Max to hurry up because they don't have enough ammo. When the download is complete, Echelon declares that it's a threat to U.S. freedom. After that, the program shuts down. The agents break through the defenses and all three are apprehended, but are soon released to avoid any publicity. Camilla shows up to hand Max a 3 million euro check from Mueller. Afterwards, Max asks her to join him for a vacation in Paris, and she happily agrees. Max receives a message with congratulations from Yuri. Yuri, now in Moscow, has ditched his glasses, shaved off his stubble, and donned a uniform. Turns out he's a FSB major. He reports to the general, who praises him for his contribution to saving the world.